What I want to start off by saying was basically a story from when I was younger. I started off in high school and middle school taking a lot of co uh, coursework in engineering and computer science. And um, basically what I was destined to be, according to everyone, was an engineer. I was really interested in material sciences, I was really interested in structure, but I was also interested in aesthetics. So that presented a little bit of an issue right off the bat. Um, what I've fallen into is the theory that basically we're all good at one thing. That happened at college. When I was there, I talked to the school counselor about how I was bored, how I was fighting with professors, and how I longed for a more creative path. And she basically turned to me and said, well, you're in engineering, so you're most likely someone who's cold, calculated, and not really that creative. So I took that as to heart for a little while, and it took eight years of undergrad and three and a half years of grad school to get over that um, and realize that it was a deeply flawed argument. People are not just good at one thing. They're not just you know, what they are. They're not just their job or their career path. They're, they're, more, they're more faceted than that. So we're going to talk about the last 2.6 million years of human tool technology to get past that, OK? Um, to start off, we, about 2.6 million years ago, we started to use hammers uh, in the forms of just big blocks of stone like this, which is aptly named a hammer stone. And what happened was we started for the first time to realize that as a species, we can actually affect the world around us. A little while later, we started doing a process called flint napping, which you can see as an example on the right, and we started to create hand axes. This was the first time we decided as a group to actually become makers. We decided as a species that we were going to actually look at the tools around us, look at the materials, and start to affect change. It was a pretty amazing time in our lives, and we've gone on to make some more interesting tools since then. Um, some tools that have actually shaped our culture and our civilizations. Some tools that have gotten more accurate, sometimes more dangerous. But it's been a really cool process for us over the last 2.6 million years, wouldn't you say? Moving on, we head to the Paleolithic times, and we develop a new skill set, painting. Basically, what happened is that we decided that we saw the world around us, and we figured that we need to start documenting it. So artists and artisans, people, just started to actually document the world around them. They started to paint on the, on the caves, and what they did was, we think, basically to describe herd migrations, using it as a teaching tool, and also just to basically create a process to show that they were there, that we are here, we are people, we've made an effect on the world. I think it's a really interesting thought process, since we still do this very process today. This is something that's still ingrained in us today. And uh, it's really a great thing. We found that we have certain materials, we have tools, we have a problem. How do these things go together to solve them? Moving on, we create a great civilization. We create another one. We start to develop things like the wheel, melt, fire, melt metals with strong, controlled fire to create new, process, new uh, materials. We start to really affect the world. We even create techniques to actually move monolithic structures and monolithic rocks. We really push human technology further. We run into an issue, though. There's a lot of us now. What do we do? How do we deal with it? Not everybody has to learn every skill set to survive anymore. We can now break down our processes and our, and our techniques. What are we going to call this? I say let's call it division of labor. Okay? No longer do I have to know everything to survive. You could be a potter. She can be a, a weaver. We can all do different things, different aspects of society to make society flourish. We're still using the same concept today, aren't we? Fast forward a little bit further, we get to Rome. Rome sees some pretty amazing innovations. We have things like technology of concrete. We can have running water. We have paved roads for the first time. It's a really wonderful time to be alive, OK? But division of labor has gotten a lot worse. There's slaves. There's freed men. There's Romans. There's senators. There's even an emperor now. Is this good? Is this bad? Only time will tell. But everyone wanted to be in Rome. As we move forward, we get into the Renaissance, a time when artists and artisans start to really break from each other. Artists start to create works of, works of like these, these paintings on, that you'll see here. And what's going on is some really amazing wa works of art. When they start to affect each other is when they get into the, the, the difference between artist and artisan. 
Artisans have made items for daily use. They create carvings and sculptures that we still have today, buildings, items like this plate that you see before you. It's a really great time. Division of labor has become so engrossed in our society. It's a good thing, right? Renaissance also creates a new thing. The idea of the Renaissance man. People who buck the convention of, of single-skilled occupation. These are people that have actually gone against the grain of society. People like Leonardo da Vinci, who, had, who we look back at as a genius, right? Well, Leonardo da Vinci was not alone in history. There are many great people of, of time, in time that actually do some really great things and are what we would consider Renaissance men or even divergent thinkers. Divergent thinkers are people that can think laterally across a problem. They don't just use the tools and techniques of their, of their career path. They use different things to, to process that information. They use creativity in different ways. People like Benjamin Franklin are also one of those, those divergent thinkers. These are people that have been idols for me my entire life growing up. Growing up in Philadelphia, I saw a giant statue of Benjamin Franklin downtown, uh, just simply labeled the maker. And to me, that was always a great thing. This guy was one of the founding fathers of our nation. He also did a great things to bring us together as a people and never really putting himself in the limelight. He always liked to control things from, the, from behind the scenes. But what can we learn from these people? They usually have a couple really cool things about them. They're usually rebellious in nature. They're usually pretty ambitious. Um, and these are great examples of things that people should have in their life. You should be rebellious in nature. You should be ambitious. Not to say that this is bad for society, this can be very good. One of the reasons that this could be really good is to help break you out of creative ruts. I myself have dealt with a lot of creative ruts in my life. Going through college and trying to be the person that everybody I took classes from wanted me to be, trying to break from traditions as much as I could, but always kind of clawing my way back to those parts in life, I've realized that what I need to do is I need to think laterally. I need to think things like Dieter Rams did. He had several rules for good design, one of which was good design should be unobtrusive. Good design should, should be something that you should be able to see and use. So when I was applying my work to art, I should think like an industrial designer. I should think like someone else outside of my creative field. These are really good things. So I get to, I'm in undergrad and I start to break from tradition. This was the mustache bench. It was a bench that I designed for two people to sit side by side it's made out of solid wood and covered in truck bed coating. The reason why I picked the truck bed liner is because I wanted something that was different, that was rugged, and something that was extremely durable. I wanted to be able to put this, this piece outside, inside, wherever. If it was gonna be on a snow-capped mountain, it could be on a snow-capped mountain. I wanted the piece to survive and live with time. But I was starting to think like an industrial designer. I move on to grad school, and I start to think in even more lateral directions. These are lamps that I made for my graduate thesis work. What was really interesting about this process was five of the lamps are designed to basically be based off of artists, five are industrial designers, and five are craftspeople. Can anyone tell the difference? No. Because if you use their general principles to apply to each other, you start to break down these barriers between them. You start to do some really creative things. You start to break the barriers that you've been put in front of you as a, as a creative or as a person in general. So with these, they're all 3D printed and they all exhibit the same exact three uh, parts, parts to them. There's a top plate, a diffuser, and a bottom plate. Being that they're 3D printed, I don't have to worry about mass manufacturing. I can mass manufacture custom objects now. What's even better than that, these don't sit in a warehouse. So they're not taking up space. They're not taking up some valuable resource that could be used for another, another object. I love this even more. This is actually a robotic arm fitted with a welding head and it's made to be programmed like a 3D printer. This is a company called MX3D. They're working out of uh, Europe and what they're doing is they're 3D printing stainless steel structure to act as bridges. So they're using only the smallest amount of material they need to survive. This is really a really giant leap forward. It's something that we could only see through 3D printing and through our newer process. What we're doing again is we're looking at here are my, here's my materials, there are my tools, I have a problem, how can I solve them? One of the greatest things about this is that this is a technology that can live well past itself and anyone can use. 
This is a technology that it's going to become more and more in use. So to end my talk, I just want you to remember a couple simple things. These are our main principles. We've been living with them since day one, 2.6 million years ago. Here are my materials. There are my tools. I have a problem. How can these things go to solve them? I ask every one of you to think about your creative fields or your fields in general. And just remember that any of these fields can be broken down. You can think laterally in any time in your life. And you should do it. Thank you.